Thank you uh, very much for the invitation and that um, very kind introduction. Let me see if I can get this started. I thought um, that since I was asked to talk about the uh, potential benefits of marine reserves and marine protected areas on fisheries, that I would show you the screensaver from my computer. This is from a marine reserve in South Africa called Tsetse Kama, and that's a river otter that just crawled out after killing a four-foot-long shark. Um, in the surf here. It's un unbelievable. So it's great fishing within rain reserves. Oh, I think it is, but let me just get it closer. Is that better? How's that? Okay. So marine reserves and fisheries, um, this is a uh, contentious topic, and so I was thanking Julia for forcing me to talk about this in the mix of a bunch of uh, fisheries biologists, but it should be interesting to see what potential ways uh, marine reserves might uh, have some benefits for fisheries. So to do this, I thought I'd divide the talk up into uh, three parts. One is start with um, what we know from studying marine reserves and to lesser extent marine protected areas from around the world in terms of what they can do. Um, then central part of the talk, talk about why there's a shift to networks of marine reserves and marine protected areas in a number of different places around the planet. Um, and that the reason for that will be important in terms of thinking about the connections with fisheries. And then I want to come back to the last part talking about can marine reserves mitigate at least some, if not all, of their costs um, to those individuals that are excluded from fishing in certain places. So <clears throat> if you take all of the marine protected areas on the planet in the ocean, um, and these are data from about four or five years ago, and scrunch them all together in one place, it adds up to that area in yellow on the map. And if you took, at that time, all of the marine reserves, which are areas fully protected, um, no-take marine reserves, it adds up to that little box in red. So it's a very, very small fraction of the surface of the sea um, that is in either one of these forms of protection. But that doesn't mean that we haven't learned a lot because that little red dot is actually composed of marine reserves that are distributed all over the planet. Um, as of the latest synthesis, there are about 125 around the planet where we have peer-reviewed scientific publications that have looked at their impacts. And so that's a pretty extensive database uh, from which to draw on. Um, the number of publications is um, growing exponentially. And so we, we know a lot about what happens inside and near the uh, boundaries of marine reserves. And basically, the message is that there are dramatic changes that happen when you exclude fishing within these parts of the sea. Um, combining all of those 125 studies, they didn't all necessarily measure uh, all of these different characteristics. Uh, there are large positive changes in biomass, in the average density, in the average size of individuals, and in the average diversity of species um, across this entire uh, global data set. Um, there's enormous variability in terms of the magnitude of the response. As you can see, each one of those dots is the actual value from an individual study, and the averages in some of these cases are skewed up by the fact that some of the reserves have spectacular changes of thousands of percent increases in abundance um, after the exclusion of fishing. So um, relatively large changes. There's, um, <clears throat> despite um, lots of, of comments and suggestions, uh, there's no geographical pattern. This isn't a pattern that just shows up in tropical marine reserves. And in fact, if you split this up into temperate systems and, and tropical systems, there's no significant difference in the magnitude of response we see within any of these variables. And if anything, temperate systems actually have larger magnitude of response um, in these metrics than tropical reserves. So those are averages. If you actually look at individual species, um, there you see a very different story. Only about, well, less than two-thirds of the individual species increase in abundance, a little over a third. 
actually decrease in abundance or are, or are lower in abundance inside reserves relative to areas outside. So those average magnitude of changes are associated with the fact that uh, these species with positive change um, are increasing much, much more than on average, the ones that are having um, declines. Now, some of the declines are just uh, predictable changes you'd expect on the basis of, of, of ecological interactions that get reset by allowing the abundance of various species within these systems to go back to something approaching more uh, natural levels. One of the more common ones is a tr common trophic cascades where you see that cessation of fishing on top predators uh, commonly can lead to uh, increased predation than on uh, herbivores within the system, which can cascade down and have impacts on lower trophic levels. Um, here are some data comparable to that for the Anacapa Reserve, which is a very tiny reserve off the shore of uh, Santa Barbara in the Channel Islands. It's been there for about 30 years that uh, this small reserve has about six times the abundance of lobster relative to areas outside. And then you have these alternating effects on trophic levels, declines in urchins, and dramatic increases in the abundance of kelp. And that this isn't just a, um, an effect that is seen in terms of average abundance. It actually really changes the dynamics of this system. If you look at how the marine reserve in Anacapa has responded to a variety of different climatic um, fluctuations over the last 30 years, it has a very different pattern of dynamics than areas outside that have been unprotected over the same period of time. And there, in this area, there are really two common states that the, the uh, system can be in, these kind of lush kelp forests with a large diversity of seaweeds at the base of the trophic web. Um, and another one's where you can get large urchin barrens, where you get very large densities of sea urchins that uh, mow down the kelp. And this figure up here basically just shows a um, time series looking at the state of sites inside the marine reserve versus the ones outside, uh, going from being in this uh, kelp forest state, a metric that I'm not going to tell you what it is, to um, alternating into this uh, kelp forest, I mean this uh, urchin barren dynamic. And what, what happened over this 30 year period is the, the, um, the marine reserve stayed in this continuous kelp bed uh, state for the entire 30 year period where every one of the 20 some odd um, sites that have been monitored uh, around the Channel Islands um, that were not in marine reserves during this period of time fluctuated between kelp beds and urchin dynamics. So very different dynamics. Most of the transitions were associated with El Nino um, and very different patterns of resilience in the system over time. That kind of pattern has been seen in a few other marine reserves that have been looked at for long periods of time. So you can get very different patterns of abundance, very different dynamics, very different resilience to uh, um, climatic change. We know, um, despite the fact that there have been enormous number of studies of marine reserves, the number of studies of marine protected areas, which have um, lesser levels of protection and allow some um, forms of extraction, uh, we know far less about them. There have been far fewer um, scientific studies. And most show these kinds of patterns where you get looking at, um, in this case, <coughs> excuse me, the green being fully protected marine reserve, uh, the um, yellow in, is a, uh, an area that, that is partially protected and the, the blue one on the outside is, is an area that's been is fully fished. And you commonly see these kinds of intermediate level responses. If you look at all of the existing studies where we can do this comparison um, in a meta-analysis, it's a very small number um, by comparison to the number of marine reserves where you have in the same region fully protected marine reserves versus partially protected MPAs. But they show a consistent response of about a two to threefold um, increase in abundance, uh, density, or biomass, any of these metrics, relative to the partially protected areas. And that's about all we know from partial protection, but that it's substantially lower levels of, of response than you see within marine reserves. OK, so uh, these. These kinds of changes demonstrate that there are typically large effects within reserves after they're established, in many cases in relatively short periods of time, since most of these have not been around for long uh, intervals. Uh, but 
for all practical purposes, um, despite the fact that these are large changes, in every case, they're relatively small effects on species. And, and that has, is driven largely by the fact that um, these are small. And so even if we look at the Channel Islands, which is a set of islands off the coast of, of Santa Barbara, where in the early 2000s there was a process to develop a network of marine reserves that ended up with this collection of marine reserves in green and lesser protected areas as well. This was 26% of the sanctuary waters that were set aside in some form of protection, um, which at the time was a very large fraction. It was one of the world's first actual networks that included a number of reserves. But it's, it's still, you know, 20% of that management area. It's not 20% or 25% of the relevant scale for species in the system. And that's really going to be their geographical range. And just to, to show you that, if you think about the average geographical range of coastal species along this coast, it's about 50% longer than the stretch of coastline you can see in this map. And here's that 25% um, set of, of marine reserves that are around the Channel Islands. It's still a minute fraction of the uh, individuals within any of the species of this system are protected by this area. And that's true uh, for virtually all of these marine reserves that are uh, there around the world. So the real issue is that if these things are going to have any benefits from a conservation standpoint to species persistence in a variety of forms, um, they have to be scaled up. And that's the only way they're going to have really any population consequences. So how do we do that? Well, the, way, the main way that's being done in a variety of different settings is by building networks, large-scale networks, of these MPAs. Um, the, the biggest on the planet by far now is the uh, collection of reserves and MPAs in the Great Barrier Reef uh, Park, which has about a third of the entire Great Barrier Reef now in complete no-take marine reserves, about another third in partial protected marine protected areas. Uh, there's the Channel Islands, and uh, as Terry noted, there's a process going on for the entire state of California called the Marine Life Protection Act, which I'll talk a little bit more. Uh, the coast of South Africa is, is targeting 20% of its coastline in MPAs by the end of this decade, and there are a num number of other kinds of nascent um, MPA uh, network efforts going on. Okay, so what, what is a network? Um, we, we had to face this problem in a big way because the California's Marine Life Protection Act put into law that California was supposed to uh, put in place a scientifically designed ecological network of marine <coughs> protected areas and marine reserves. But they didn't define what that means. And of course, this is one of these classic scientific terms that has um, all kinds of different meanings to different people, and so this creates all kinds of interesting challenges. Uh, but fortunately, um, in this case, uh, uh, ecological networks, I think, have really nice analogs to social networks and computer networks. They're effectively a collection of things that are connected in various ways, and the function of that collection of units depends upon how you connect them. And you change the nature of the connections, you change the function of the system. So, you know, the classic example in social networks is you can ask, you know, what's the likelihood that this woman down here has an interesting idea and it somehow gets up into Kevin Bacon's head? And <clears throat> of course, that depends upon these connections, and you just change one linkage in this social network, and the dynamics are going to be really different. Well, in many ways, ecological networks are much simpler in terms of thinking about these kinds of connections and how it might affect the function of these systems because of a couple of things. One is that the major way that they're connected is through movement of both adults and, and young. Um, and the other is that if we, if we think about a coastline, the, the, the nature of connections is pretty linear, and so it's, you don't have to deal with uh, a lot of the really complicated problems that come in with the kind of topology of these networks when you're thinking about social and computing systems. So two kinds of movement, um, but for the purposes of how this is going to function, just the cartoon version here, they have really different consequences, and it, and it just comes back to this very simple fact that um, 
if adults leave the boundary of a reserve, their risk goes up. And this is just because the uh, actions, the human actions that are being restricted are something that affects the adults. But if larvae, or if the young, microscopic young that are produced by most fish and invertebrates leave the boundary of reserve, there are few risks as long as they can um, get to another protected area. If they have to settle out in some place that's not protected, then at least through their life cycle, they're exposed to the same kind of risks, risks as movement of adults would, would see. So this difference between adult movement and larval movement plays a really important role in terms of thinking about these functional networks of MPAs. Now, the formal um, way of, of doing network design from a conservation standpoint really steps back to think about um, how can we use a collection of protected areas to promote the persistence of species that are threatened by some kind of activity. And this is really no different than thinking about problems of species persistence in terms of terrestrial animals. There's a well-developed body of literature. And really, there's a whole variety of approaches that can be taken. Um, one of the ones that we uh, did early in this, in, in this decade, um, it, they all basically come up with a, a set of conditions that if you exceed those those, uh, that threshold that you've got persistence of this particular species through time. And so it's a matter of solving for what those are. And <clears throat> in this case, there are uh, two ways that this can happen. And one is that you can achieve persistence through large individual size of a single MPA. And this is really a result that goes back to um, analyses that were used for a terrestrial reserve design many decades ago. And it really comes down to a very simple set of rules that the size of the protected area needs to be larger than the mean dispersal distance, in some cases several, a few times the mean dispersal distance of uh, the individuals within that particular species. And the logic is very simple. You've got species that have very different home ranges. You put down some protected area and some individuals that have large uh, patterns of movement are going to spend a lot of time outside. Other ones are going to spend their entire life um, inside the boundaries of the reserve. So the level of protection and the potential for a single MPA to promote persistence uh, is tied directly to the size of the MPA relative to the scale of movement of those adults. Very simple rule. The problem is, how do you, how do you actually implement that? Because if we in the MLPA process in California, you know, this is the list of, of uh, you know, a bunch of species along the coast that were kind of targeted for consideration for thinking about how the process might affect their dynamics. And of course, the scales of movement vary by orders of magnitude. So that the choice of any particular MPA size, you know, say you have 100 kilometers of shoreline in a reserve, is going to have some class of species that are going to benefit and other ones are going to get little or no benefit simply because they're going to be moving in and out all the time. And, and making it, whoops, where'd that come from? Oh. An embedded slide. It went all the way to the end. So, you know, one option is you, you make really large reserves to kind of deal with the ones on the right end of that figure at the last time. But, you know, aside from this example, which is the, the reserve, well, it's an MPA at the moment, but it will be a reserve eventually of the Northwest Hawaiian Islands, which is on the order of a couple thousand kilometers in length scale, um, there's never going to be MPAs that are going to be able to meet those size demands for the species on the right side of that table. And for virtually any marine ecosystem, you're going to have a group of species that are going to be in that range. So it's going to be this, any choice of MPA size for an individual MPA is going to have winners and losers. Lo well, winners and individuals that are, uh, for all practical purposes, are not going to know it's there. So the alternative way that you can get persistence, which is critical in terms of thinking about these network designs, is 
um, through total network area. And this really comes down to uh, this issue of the movement of young. Because if you have the dispersal of young from one MPA to the next, that's equivalent from the standpoint of the population uh, dynamics and potential contribution to persistence as if those young had stayed home in the MPA where they were born. And so this issue comes down to then if larvae can make the jump, or if these young can move from one MPA to the next, um, then you have the potential for a collection of multiple MPAs to provide added benefit beyond what you can get from the individual contributions. And again, if you do the formal analysis um, on the basis of a variety of modeling exercises about what that takes, it really comes down to a fairly simple relationship that the spacing of MPA needs to be less than the scale over which larvae disperse. Now, the good news is that what we know about how far marine larvae disperse is that they go a long way. If you compare, for example, the, the mean dispersal scale estimates that we have from a whole variety of genetic studies for uh, marine young, propagules of algae as well as uh, larvae of invertebrates and fishes, relative to propagules of uh, terrestrial sedentary species, you can see that there's about three orders of magnitude increases in the average scale of dispersal. So this, this means that networks of protected areas can be much more widely spaced in the sea than on land and still get the potential benefits of having multiple sites connected by dispersal. The bad news is, though, that just as in the case of adult movement, you've got this large variation across species in terms of what that spacing um, requirement really needs to be. And just as in the adult movement, you've got, in this case, six or seven orders of magnitude of mean dispersal distance that um, these things can go based upon a number of characteristics, such as how long they're drifting in the plankton behavior and so on and so forth. So that means that for any pattern of spacing of two MPAs, you're going to have some species that are going to regularly make the jump and other ones that are not, which is over here. And as we reduce the spacing, we increase the fraction of species that can regularly make these kinds of jumps. So it's, in many ways, it's analogous to the, uh, the challenge with the uh, adult movement, but it's going in the opposite direction. Okay? And as you get them closer and closer together, you have a larger fraction of species in the system that can regularly make the jump. You also have the, the concomitant effect, in this case, of having a larger amount of area that's protected to increase the probability that a dispersing larva actually ends, lands in an MPA. So putting these two dynamics together effectively uh, gives you the in a simplified presentation, the, the framework for where these, uh, model, these, the, the model results suggest that the uh, network guidelines need to reside to really provide strong conservation benefit um, for the persistence of species, where MPA size is driven by the short distance movement of both adults and young, and spacing is used to um, add benefit for a broader range of species in the system, those that have the potential for longer distance dispersal. And by changing the combination of these two, you can um, change the fraction of species in the system that are likely to get some conservation benefit. Um, what emerged in the Marine Life Protection Act was these guidelines as a preferred recommendation for um, size of MPAs and spacing to try to uh, capture as much of this ecological diversity in the system as, as we could. Now, that doesn't mean that, in fact, the actual um, uh, MPAs that emerged met all those guidelines, but those were the kind of guidelines that were on the table. This is what actually um, emerged for the first part of this process. This is the central coast of California that goes from Point Conception and then continues on up past Monterey Bay. Um, it's a network of about uh, 30 MPAs. I believe 18 of them are full no-take marine reserves. The system has marched up the coast um, 
now, and we're in the final stages of evaluating proposals for that part of the coast, and then it's going to move down to Southern California, and um, the entire state will be done by this process by 2011. Okay, so that's networks. And um, relatively uh, a simple presentation of, of the, the, the underlying uh, logic behind where the guidelines for our network design might come from. Um, but, of course, not everyone likes these solutions um, to the problem. And everything I've talked about so far has really been looking at this from the standpoint of the conservation issues and promoting persistence of species that are, are at risk when they're not under the protection of some kind of MPA. And so the, the whole point of, the, of Julia's request for me to talk on this was to, and to look at this issue of whether, in fact, there are design guidelines. And there's been a lot of discussion about this in the MPA literature and certainly in um, the public comment that there may be the possibility for win-win benefits by utilizing MPAs where these kinds of individual MPAs as well as networks may have benefits for both conservation and fisheries. And the reason, the logic behind where these multiple benefits could come from um, is exactly the opposite of the, of the challenges that faced the, uh, the issues of network design from the standpoint of movement of individuals. And that is that these adults and larvae don't know where the end edges of these reserves are. And so when adults spill over to the outside, they become part of the fishery, which is a challenge from the standpoint of the benefits for persistence. It's a benefit from the standpoint of the fishery. And the same kind of pattern can happen with the export of young, that if they land in a reserve, of another reserve, it has the potential for benefiting the persistence. If they land outside, it has the potential of seeding um, individuals that would become part of the fishery in the future. So it's these very simple um, uh, mechanisms where individuals can leave and become part of the fishery. That is the basis for all of the real arguments the way MPAs might have some benefits for fisheries to at least counter some of the cost of excluding fishing from the areas where they initially were uh, put in place. Now, uh, there have been a small number, a modest number of um, studies that have looked at this issue of adult spillover across the edge. And it's um, mostly been done uh, by looking at uh, patterns of abundance and how those are expected to change as a consequence of fishing near the edge of the reserve. So if you have a reserve, if there's spillover um, of, of adult movement across this boundary, then fishing on the area outside is effectively uh, sampling some of the individuals on the inside. And so these declines in abundance inside the reserve are a consequence of the fact that you've got movement across that boundary. And you can use the shape of these, and there have been a couple of recent um, theoretical studies by uh, Julie Kellner that came out that showed how you could use the shape of these to infer a variety of things about ad patterns of adult spillover. One of them is down here, is, which is just a meta-analysis of the existing studies where you could actually pull this together, which is a small number. But the vast majority of these adult spillover uh, influences are on the order of a few hundred meters away from the edge of the reserve. Um, in a few cases, they go out as far as a couple of kilometers. Now, admittedly, these are data from that initial data set of marine reserves, which tend to be relatively small, and so their scale of influence is, is also relatively small. Now, the, 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 the real poster child of how this kind of adult spillover can influence fisheries outside, of course, comes from the closures on the Georges Bank that were put in place in the 1990s as a result of the collapse of the cod population. There are a number of closed areas, these green areas that were closed to enhance the recovery of cod. And at the same time that they restricted fishing for cod, they also excluded fishing for a number of other species that potentially had incidental effects on, on cod. So the cod have still not recovered um, very dramatically despite uh, more than a decade of protection. Uh, but some of the other species in the system have shown really dramatic effects. And one of them is um, haddock. And so 
these are the uh, data for the pattern of, of fishing effort from the vessel monitoring system for the haddock fishery um, in, the, in this region now with now five closed areas. And what you can see is that as you uh, go from the purples up to the reds, you're having much larger numbers amount of time that uh, the bulk of this fishery is fishing right on the edge of um, some of these closures. And the reason, of course, is that um, the catch rates there are dramatically higher. And so here's the catch rates per, per hour um, for 2003. They've continued this pattern over the last couple of years. I think Steve Morasco will probably talk a little bit about this later on in his other talk. But um, it's on, on the order of 50 times higher catch rates per unit time um, along the edge of the closed areas than in the average areas in between. And in this year, 42% of the entire haddock catch was within one kilometer of the edge of a closed area, and 73% within five kilometers. So for all practical purposes, I mean, this is a spillover fishery at the moment where the vast majority of the haddock fishery is coming just from the spillover of adults uh, across the boundary of these closed areas. There, there are a number of other ones where you, you can get some evidence of that adult closure. The, 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 the flip side, though, the, the other part of this whole story of the, of the export of young is a much more difficult problem to actually evaluate empirically. And so here's, here's another thing that happened with this cod closure is a dramatic uh, increase in um, scallop populations within those George's Bank um, closed areas and huge increase in size and abundance. The biomass went up 14-fold over the course of six years after these closures. Um, and as I showed in the beginning, the av you know, that average increase in biomass of 400% increase within marine reserves, if you translate that into egg production, um, it, you know, it's, it's a huge increase in potential production of, of young on average. But uh, demonstrating that, in fact, that um, production of young is benefiting populations outside is a really difficult problem that either involves tracking larvae, which uh, is a really difficult problem. Some of us have been trying to solve for two decades. Um, and so there, there are virtually no studies that have really empir direct empirical evidence of enhanced um, export of young, despite the fact that we, it's clear that there's uh, large increases being produced and we know what, on average how far these things uh, tend to go. The, the one exception is results that have come from Robin Pelk's work along the coast of South Africa and this was made possible by the fact that there are a number of reserves there where the fishing intensity is so high outside for mussels that you get these really abrupt um, density gradients where you have large abundances of mussels inside the reserve and effectively none or very, very small populations outside. And so what she can do is go as a function of distance from the reserve and look at the, the larval recruitment of mussels um, as you go out for several kilometers. And in every one of the reserves where, she was, where there was this abrupt density gradient, you see this kind of exponential decline in recruitment as a function of distance suggesting in this case for a species that has a larval period of between one and two weeks of uh, uh, enhancements out to on the order of 10 to 15 kilometers in terms of larval export. Okay, so it's, it's these kinds of uh, contributions to populations outside that are really at the base of the potential benefits for, um, um, from MPAs to fisheries. But all, all, that doesn't really tell us whether this, the, the magnitude of these impacts is sufficient to be able to counter the costs of reducing the fishing within those closed areas. And that's really the question is whether, how this is going to affect um, either the total yields or the spatial patterns and a whole variety of things along those lines. This is something, though, that um, is really difficult to measure um, empirically again because of the fact that the existing reserves are so small so that they're even their potential contribution to um, yields outside with the exception of closed areas like the George's Bank um, are going to be rather minute. So most of the exploration of this question still remains in the domain of modeling. And as a result, um, there's no 
clear consensus on um, what the patterns are likely to be. There have been about 100 studies now published on looking at the potential impacts of marine reserves, modeling their potential impacts on fisheries. And we're in the process of really trying to make some sense out of the patterns you see, because you get results that are really all over the map, everything from um, having comparable yields with and without reserves to increased yields to dramatic costs in yields. And, um, and this reflects the fact that there's been a real diversity of approaches taken to looking at how you model this problem. And so just as a, a quick summary of the synthesis so far, I think there are some clear patterns that emerge from looking at this diversity of models. First, if adults move a lot, there's not much of an effect on yield. And this is simply as a consequence of the fact that they're moving so much they're going to be caught. They'll be caught in different places. So the ultimate effect, the same reason why high movement doesn't lead to any benefit for these species from MPAs is the reason why you get no cost um, in terms of yield. You potentially do get a cost in terms of profits because they're having to be caught in different locations. There are some clear um, situations where reserves will absolutely decrease yields. And um, two that have been demonstrated in a number of uh, modeling exercises are one determines how the added, uh, the buildup of density within marine reserves uh, influences the uh, demographics processes that uh, these species see and the density dependence results. If these high density populations within reserves lead to uh, density dependent reductions in fecundity, then all the potential benefits of that export of young that comes from having these um, more larger, more abundant uh, individuals within the reserves is going to be, or a big part of that is going to be lost. The other way that you can get um, decreased yields is if larval dispersal is, is distance is small so that it stays within the boundary of the reserve. The classic example here is a number of studies have looked at modeling abalone <coughs> which are species that don't move much at all as adults and have typically very limited larval dispersal so that even modest, um, moderately sized MPAs are going to retain the bulk of the larval dispersal. So there's no potential for benefit to the fisheries outside. These kinds of consequences then, limited dispersal of larvae, density dependence affecting fecundity, necessarily are going to decrease yields. Now, there are also a number of of potential mechanisms, though, where you can have reserves increasing yields. And I'm not going to go through these in, in great detail. I want to give you an example or a little bit of uh, discussion of the first three that are kind of interesting because they're interesting uh, new ways of thinking about how spatial regulation of where fishing occurs might alter the ultimate population dynamics of the fish and ultimately then the, the yields. Now, all of these things, the only way that you can generate um, higher yields is all really tied to this effect, that um, this potentially large exponential increase in production that comes with getting old and fat, and um, how that the benefits then in each of the cases where there have been modeling examples all come from when there are opportunities to get um, enhanced population growth rates by having these large um, females be in particular locations. So for example, um, one that this is some work that uh, Chris Costello and a number of collaborators have uh, in a manuscript that's going out fairly soon really deals with coming back to this issue of spatial connections. The location of where those females are um, does it matter in terms of population dynamics? And here, <clears throat> the way that it can matter in a very big way is because of the fact that uh, as, as anybody who has looked at any satellite image or uh, done anything in the coastal ocean knows, you have very turbulent, um, complicated flows. And the more we've done uh, modeling of how these flows um, influence the dispersal of particles, um, leads us to see very clearly that there are very complicated patterns of connections between places. And that if we model the way places are connected by a simple 
Gaussian um, probability distribution of how far things go that is uniform along a coastline, we really misrepresent the nature of connectivity that occurs. These are um, four different runs that come from um, 3D circulation models that are creating something that we call a con connectivity matrix, which looks at how one place is connected to another. And it essentially, you read it like this. Uh, these are, this is a coastline going along a coast, and so this is going from north to south, and the current is flowing from north to south. And so these are locations along the coast that are where larvae are released in a 3D model. And then the intensity of the color uh, gives you a prediction of the number of larvae you'd exp that, that's settled uh, in these model runs as, the, at, as a function of location along the coast. And so there are, as you can see, there are places in all of these, and these are driven by different uh, flow dynamics in different species life histories. There are places that are hot spots in, in this matrix where you've got a lot of settlement and places where you don't. And the, this is generated by the fact that you have some locations, such as here, which tend to be really strong source populations um, for other locations. And then you have other areas, such as this part of the coast here, which isn't really a strong source of young for any other part of the coast. So you have, and it's in, inevitable in these sorts of turbulent flows, you get these really strong heterogeneous patterns of connectivity that lead to source and sink dynamics in terms of the uh, potential uh, contribution of young produced at different locations along the coast. And what Chris's uh, work has shown is that it, it, in these kinds of situations, um, it, it leads to a situation where yields and, more importantly, profits uh, are, in, in all cases we've explored so far, um, peak um, in, in situations where some fraction of the coastline is set aside in marine reserves, that marine reserves are always part of the optimal solution, and it tends to be focused on these areas which are sources, l large sources for recruits um, for other parts of the coast. So spatial connections could be, and the details of spatial connections, could be one mechanism where um, spatial closures could play a very big role in terms of uh, influencing total uh, population growth rates and ultimately yields and profits. The problem is, of course, that we have to know what these patterns of connections are. It's easy to do from a simple model, um, but that doesn't necessarily tell us what the patterns are going on in the real world. So if we knew this, the implications of these modeling exercises are that it, it tends to identify places that should be focal areas for implementation of closures. So that's one. Another one, <clears throat> which is a, a very different kind of potential benefit from the way spatial closures might change the dynamics, really comes into play with thinking about the fact that um, humans are agents of natural selection. And so when we fish some population, particularly if we do it intensively, um, we are creating um, selection on that population um, that is going to reflect the nature of the mortality that um, we impinge on that population. And so the, uh, the potential then for um, fishing by to lead to selection for individuals to mature at a younger age to have a higher fitness under this new selective regime um, can lead to uh, evolutionary changes within fished populations. And the mechanism is really very simple. If you, if you create an intense um, mortality rate that leads to uh, selection for earlier maturation to the extent that there are uh, energetic trade-offs that are uh, imposed by the costs of maturing at an earlier age that then lead to reductions in growth. That growth. This leads to smaller fish at a given age, which has um, consequent effects in terms of uh, total reproductive output and um, biomass yield and sustainability. Now, uh, this problem has been addressed in a number of, of uh, studies over the years in terms of thinking about the implications for um, fisheries management. There are a number of uh, um, evolutionarily stable, optimal uh, harvest strategies that have been proposed and things along those lines, but they all effectively involve reducing the overall mortality rate to reduce the level of selection. Otherwise, you get this um, um, 
counteracting effect where the evolutionary responses reduce biomass yields. So an alternative way that spatial closures could influence this is that if you have the, um, by having areas that are closed to fishing that are protecting these large old females, if in fact those then represent a large fraction they, they become the mothers of a large fraction of the subsequent population. You have a, a mechanism of counteracting the intense selection that is going on outside the marine reserves. And so an alternative way of dealing with this problem is by spatially segregating where this intense selective pressure actually happens. So we asked this question. Uh, developed this is work that Marissa Basket took the, took the lead on, and she did a really remarkable set of models on this of coupling um, population genetics, quantitative genetics models with um, ecological models to look at this uh, potential effect and whether spatial closures can solve it. Uh, there are a diverse array of data sets we used for looking at this problem, including some interesting historical data for Atlantic cod, which I can show you here. Uh, these are patterns of um, size at maturation of Atlantic cod over that where it was reduced by about 50 percent over the course of 40 percent or so over the course of about 20 year period. Um, and so the blue values here are actual data. The, the uh, purple ones are the model fits from um, f for the, the long term data set that came out of this. And so we can look at the consequences then of, of uh, segregating the bulk of your parents into marine reserves is a mechanism of counteracting evolutionary change imposed by intensive fishing. And so if you look at the responses of the system in the absence of reserves, as you increase the harvest mortality rate, and this on a log scale, um, what happens is, is that you uh, initially you have relatively small effect on size and maturity. As that, as that uh, harvest mortality rate gets up to a certain point, becomes a strong enough selective pressure you actually have the evolution of relatively strong declines in size at maturity. And this is independent of whether it's a long distance or short distance dispersal. Um, if, if, you, if you put MPAs, and this is a, an example with 25% of MPAs for at least the species with long distance dispersal, which have a mechanism of their offspring going from the reserves to the areas outside, um, you start to counter these effects. As you go to 50% of the area in MPAs, you can get um, most of these evolutionary um, selection for um, early age at maturation being countered by the spatial segregation of where the parents, the bulk of the parents are in subsequent generations. And this has concomitant effects on yield that, and in the case of no marine reserves, those declines in size and maturation are associated with dramatic declines in yield if you increase above that level. Um, in the case of the MPAs, uh, you actually get um, substantially higher yields that in fact increase all the way up to really high fishing mortality rates. Okay, I think I have time to squeeze in the last piece. All right, um, the last one is um, this is another example of a situation that a number of people have suggested where marine reserves might actually provide some real benefits that enhance yields. And this comes into thinking about um, weakest linked fisheries. Now, if you don't know what that is, it's that guy right there. Um, and this is essentially the problem that many fisheries, if not most fisheries, are really mixed species fisheries. And so you apply any kind of a harvest rule to that mixture of species, um, even if it is the perfect thing to do in terms of the optimal yield for the target species of interest, um, you're, you're applying it to a mixture of species with different life histories. And this creates a challenge because the optimal thing to do for each of those species is different. And so as a consequence, if you have a real diversity of life history traits within a mixture of fisheries, and you, um, over time, what's going to happen is that your yield is going to be dominated by fast-growing species in terms of population growth rates, but your eventual closures are going to be set by those slow-growing species that are, that are never going to be a large part of the yield, but are eventually going to be driven to low enough patterns of abundance that they have the potential for shutting down the fishery. 
And we've seen this in, in a number of different fisheries, you know, the, this on the west coast, these number of these really slow-growing rockfish that have plummeted over the course of several decades down to extremely low um, historical biomasses uh, were the source of a number of closures, despite the fact that many of the other species in these fisheries were being harvested at relatively stable yields. If you look at the life histories of those species that shut this down, um, they show this exact kind of life history trade-off. Here are those, those uh, um, six from that last figure. They tend to be things which, um, in this mixed species fishery, tend to have much longer lifespan and mature at a much later age, slower population growth rates that are associated with that. So what are the options? Well, uh, the options are, one, is you find some mechanism of selectively harvesting so you can avoid fishing at the same intensity on these weak stock fish species. That's one. In many cases, that's, there's no technological way to do that. Uh, another is, is you, set the, you have to set the quota by these weak links. And if you don't set the quota by these, these more slow-growing life histories, you're inevitably going to be going through this period of closure, recovery, and then a fishery that booms and then closes because you're going to have those same species shutting it down. So we asked um, the last thing is we asked, and a number of people have proposed this as a potential mechanism, is can you just protect these weak links in reserves so that they are um, essentially utilizing the model I talked about in the very beginning. You guarantee their persistence with marine reserves, and then you ignore the effect of the fishery on them outside. Um, and so here's, here's what happens, some work that Alan Hastings and I have uh, been doing. And what this is a map of life history space. So uh, any species would be somewhere on here. So here's our target species. It's got some population growth rate when rare. So this is kind of the intrinsic growth rate of that population. It's got some natural lifespan um, in the absence of fishing. And <clears throat> any of the rest of the space in here is the potential for uh, other species and their combination of life history traits. And what, what, what we're able to show is that um, for all combinations of life histories, the spatial closures utilizing reserves gives you as high or higher yields than you can get by regulating by the weak stock fishery. And it comes down to really a, a variety of different regions. If you've got species up in this region, there's no consequence at all. You get the same yields because their life histories are close enough together that it really doesn't make that much difference. Um, as you go into this, this realm, which is a large realm, and this is the actual direction you would expect life history trade-offs to tend to have other species to, to go is down in this direction. Um, you've got some region here where there's no cost at all if you're, if you're regulating by reserves. And another part where you have re reduced yield over maximum yield if that weak link species didn't exist, but it's always better in the reserves than without. And then you've got this region down here where you can't do anything about it. OK, so those are three very different classes. I, you know, there's a whole variety, as I said, 100 different modeling studies. There are a variety of different ways that people have looked at this problem. And it's clearly a problem that um, we need empirical data on. And these large-scale networks that are being implemented, largely for ecosystem protection reasons, both in the Great Barrier Reef and in California and some other areas, are going to finally be of the appropriate scale to where we're going to start getting some empirical data that's going to be relevant to looking at these. I also think we need to have a lot more synthetic work in terms of looking at um, the, the various ways in which these kinds of spatial closures change the nature of population dynamics and think about it that way as opposed to reserve versus tr traditional fisheries management. And I think there are a number of cases where, in fact, those may be beneficial. There clearly are going to be a number of other species and settings um, where there are going to only be costs uh, to this kind of implementation of spatial closed areas. So thank you very much, and I'd be happy to take questions.
It's a good question. So the, the question was that um, in that in the simplistic way of thinking about the persistence problem, and in most cases this is the way it's done as a first cut, is you, you assume the extreme case, which is in, in a case where you're getting effectively no contribution from population outside the protected areas, would those protected areas be sufficient to provide persistence for that particular species? And that's the way the question is initially asked, and some of those modeling results come from looking at that extreme case. Of course, in reality, you are going to get contributions. There are going to be lower populations outside. And in, in that paper that uh, Alan and Lou and I did, we, we looked at exactly that, where you can look at um, how much of a difference there is in population size inside and outside the reserves and how that affects the total amount of area that needs to be protected to guarantee persistence. And it, as you would expect, the amount of area that needs to be protected, which in this case is totally going to be driven by the spacing, um, goes down as those population sizes outside go up. And so it really, if you're thinking about this from the standpoint of an individual species, you'd really need to think through what's the likelihood of, you know, what's the lowest likelihood of contribution you expect to get from outside to really do this exercise. If you're looking at it from the standpoint of an entire ecosystem and the species that are in there, part of the discussion, I think, really needs to be what happens if you have some species that are largely relegated to marine reserves. But it's, it's definitely a tractable problem to look at that. So, yeah, Andre. That's a very good point, and I think, you know, if, if there's one uniform conclusion that comes from all of the modeling studies of MPAs and fisheries, the easiest way to get fisheries to in, increase yields is if you've had management failure outside. It happens, you know, in virtually any model you, you put forward. So that's clearly the case in this situation, that it's a spillover fishery now because of management failure outside. What, it would, what that would look like if you actually manage the areas outside correctly and what role those uh, closed areas might play, whether there would be a net benefit or it would still be a cost, is, is a good question. Yes, in back. With this loss debate, how big the reserves are and how far apart they should be, yeah. how important is the shape of the reserve? Because if you're talking about spillover and we want to have empty expensive fisheries, should we be looking for donut reserves or something like that? Yeah. Or the yeah, that's, and so the question is, um, um, the, the role of shape of the reserve. This is a really big deal in terrestrial reserve design. And it, um, there, the main reason is because of a variety of mechanisms of movement, of enhancing the likelihood that individuals will be able to successfully get from one protected area to the next. And so, uh, you know, uh, I think there are ways that, that that same process can work in, in the ocean in terms of the interaction between shape and patterns of currents. The flip side is that the, the shape will have a big effect on the adult spillover dynamics because the, that really is going to have an influence on the edge to you know, area ratios that are going to be really important in terming the fraction of individuals that are going to spill over the boundary for a given area of protection. So there really has not been that much um, work on that issue, but I think it is something that needs to be explored. In California, the, what we did was we looked at um, these alongshore distances, given that these are mostly habitats which are confined within different depth strata, so the major movement is in that direction, with the added uh, issue that many of these life histories, as part of the life history, they move through different um, habitats and depths as they, through ontogeny. And so, um, our recommendation in that case was extend these from the shore all the way out to the edge of state waters 
in many cases that's not enough to really capture the entire life cycle, uh, but at least that sets the stage for discussions with you know, the federal considerations so you actually potentially can capture that whole life cycle. So I think shape can be a lot more important than people have really um, considered so far, but hasn't gotten much attention. Well, that's, that's a very good question. I mean, I think it really depends upon what your goals are in terms of what you define as properly managed. I mean, so, um, you know, I mean, I, they're, you know, playing, playing, manipulating the structure of the ecosystem to enhance yields for a target species. I, I mean, I don't know of examples of situations where people have done that very extensively, but you, I could easily see how you could play. I mean, in essence, the, it, it happens. I mean, you, you fish one, and it has cascading and interacting effects throughout other parts of the ecosystem. Um, that Taking that into account, to some extent, is really a core of a lot of uh, thinking about ecosystem-based fisheries management, where you've really got to think about how these interactions affect one another, such that a decision on one species has effects through, throughout the food web. Um, but that's a little bit different from saying going in and and removing all one species that's not a target for consumption to increase the abundance of something else. I mean, we do that on land all the time. I mean, that's that's farming. <laughs> you know, I mean, so there's. Um, but I don't know. Maybe I don't know what to say. I mean, I think it if it, it really depends upon your goals as to whether that's something you'd want to take into account. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think we're, we're fast approaching where we have to really integrate MPAs into the way we manage the areas outside because um, they're, they're being implemented in large amounts of area in a few parts of the ocean. And so how, how you take that into account in terms of the way the areas outside are being managed is really an important question. And to some extent, the MPAs are going to force compromises that are not the optimal thing to do outside. And other times, they might create opportunities that... Um, such as in the spillover, is potentially being a sustainable source that um, is is really just dependent upon the you know the spillover of the densities that you've got sustainably being protected within those areas. So, I, I think there we need to be lots of discussions about how this gets integrated in, um, particularly as these things become more common. I mean, because they're being driven by an, a number of goals and. Uh, interests that are not fisheries oriented, and yet they're going to have big implications in terms of uh, how fisheries are going to uh, be managed outside, or they need to. Hey, Julia. So I, I'm struck by um, the uh, sort of dichotomy in time between thinking about setting up MPA, say, along the West Coast, which are um, may come in networks, but are nevertheless pretty static things. They're here and not there. Um, and um, thinking about the, um, the pollock fishery, the ground fish fishery uh, in the Bering Sea, in which there's been some salmon bycatch issues, and uh, one strategy was to um, uh, take places out, uh, so basically time area closures. And it turned out that, that one technique that the, the fishers themselves came up with was a rolling closure, 
So um, it's basically um, speeding things up quite a lot. And um, that had some, some quite positive effects in terms of, of reducing salmon bycatch. And, and I'm thinking, is there a possibility of applying that thought of um, rather than just the sort of Eden-esque, if you build it, they will come, is here and here always, um, thinking a bit more about the dynamics uh, of the system, especially with respect to climate change. So what's the next generation of MPAs? Are they actually going to shift along the coast, or will the networks, which is sort of version two, going to take care of that? Well, that's a good challenge. So you want to do uh, generation two before generation one even gets implemented anywhere, huh? <coughs> Um, well, you know, it strikes me that I think if we, if we talk about these as really spatial closures in a broader sense and integrate that into thinking about that as one component of, of fisheries management, then rolling closures are one of the tools. And the, I didn't talk about the time course of change that's been observed within existing MPAs. Um, and I think there were, you know, the, the notion of changing those, if what your goal is, is really to uh, rebuild these reason of somewhat intact ecosystems. I mean, it's not, it's not ever going to go back to what these things used to look like because there are whole fractions of the system that are not going to recover. Um, the, the longest reserves we have on the planet are about 40 years old. And those, to this day, continue to change in terms of, of species that, are, you know, that have been very slow to recover and have now changed the nature of the community that's within them. So I think you know there, some of these things are going to be at odds with one another if, if in fact, your goal is to, is to set these aside to where they can have that ecosystem rebuilding and have at least some parts of the ocean that are more intact ecosystems with the services that come with that. Uh, that will be at odds with rotational closures. That doesn't mean that you can't integrate those with other areas that are rotational closures on more short term in, in a mix of a whole variety of different kinds of spatial planning. I mean, uh, the, the Great Barrier Reef really has that kind of a zoning approach, I think, that is, is, a, is a real model for thinking about other parts of the planet where they zoned all of the reef. So it wasn't just which areas you're going to set aside as MPAs and then the rest of it is, you know, out there for somebody in some fisheries management agency to now have to deal with your leftovers. Um, it was a very, you know, it was a much more comprehensive approach in terms of pulling that all together. So I think that's something that's really critical. No, but I think it's a really good question, and I think it also ties into the whole issue of resistance to climate shifts. And you know, to some extent, people have talked about network design as as a hedge against the fact that you've got these spacings of habitats along a coast that provides the fact that if you look at the species combinations that are within MPAs today, by having this network that's spaced within easy dispersal distance from one to the next, it provides a mechanism of movement among protected areas in the face of a shifting climate. Um, but, you know, that's a really interesting question. It's another one where it's a broader kind of impact of how you could use these to have benefits outside. And I, you know, it, I think it would be system specific in terms of w what is it about the system that is sensitive to these kinds of climate changes, such as in this case where it's really a, a storm effect that 
that kicks off the establishment of these um, urchin barons. And it's the fact that you can have a, a, a good settlement event after one of these storms that rips out kelp. And if you don't have large numbers of predators to keep those um, recruits from growing up to become adults, you suddenly have become an urchin baron. And so there's, there's a mechanistic tie. And I, you know, I think in, each, in cases like that, you could think about how the system might be able to benefit the areas in between in ways that don't have anything to do with, with fisheries yields. Um, the flip side of that is that urchins are fished. You know, so this urchins are a perfect example where there's going to be no benefit from um, uh, marine reserves in terms of urchin fisheries on this coast because the effect of cutting off fishing on urchin predators is going to reduce urchin abundances within these reserves. And so it has a negative impact on that particular fishery. It's kind of one of these... Um, enforce trade-offs because of ecological interactions. Well, thanks, Steve. Okay.